after several years of delays and unprecedented failure. NASA's Artemis One rocket finally lifted up from the mobile launch tower and headed into orbit. NASA's Artemis One wait is finally over. But everything doesn't look right with the launch pad. We shouldn't be so flabbergasted that it doesn't, because the NASA Artemis One is one of the most powerful rockets in the world that has ever lifted off from a mobile launch pad. Stick around as we discuss more about the damages discovered with the launch tower after the Artemis One rocket successfully lifted itself from the base. Rocket liftoff works by forcefully ejecting controlled, highly flammable, low-density fluid, compressing the combustive fluid through a smaller nozzle or thermal orifice pipe, then igniting the fluid to burn as it's released through a wider nozzle at the base of the rocket. This thermal process pushes the rocket to move upright from rest, upward until it fights, wins against gravitational force, and finally finds its way to space. The hard truth is that after the Artemis One rocket went through all these processes and lifted off to orbit, the 355-foot-tall mobile tower which launched the rocket was left with damages as a result of the heavy push of the four RS-25 engines, which produced about 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. Well, the tower was helpless and broke down even though NASA has spent a whopping $1 billion building the mobile tower for over a decade. When the most powerful rocket in the world is about to launch off, the environment around it isn't in the best possible possible conditions for life. The massive Space Launch System rocket and the Orion capsule were launched into space by NASA in preparation for a historic flyby of the moon. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where the roar of a NASA rocket could once again be heard at the launch pad where shuttles and Apollo missions began their adventures into space. Crowds of space enthusiasts who are eager to see for themselves how the rocket will lift off observed the event. It didn't take long for the rocket to get beyond the launch tower and begin its ascension through the atmosphere, leaving an orange ombre trail behind as it burned. The rocket's boosters ignited simultaneously, causing it to rise above an explosion of flames. Darrow Nail, a live stream commentator for NASA, announced that Artemis One was about to lift off. In his words, he said, We rise together, back to the moon and beyond. The SLS boosters finished burning up their fuel after two minutes and then fell off. The core stage rocket ran out of fuel eight minutes after liftoff and split two, leaving behind the uncrewed Orion capsule still attached to the upper stage rocket and the service module provided by the European Space Agency, which supplies the spacecraft's main propulsion and power. At over 16,000 miles per hour, Orion went on, and a short while later, it unfolded its solar arrays. If all goes as planned, the capsule will detach from the SLS upper stage after around two hours. The upper stage will then scatter 10 CubeSats, small spacecraft, in batches as it drifts away, sending them on brief missions to the moon, Mars, and an asteroid close to Earth. Orion will continue its journey in the meantime, taking roughly 10 days to get to the moon. There, it will spend a few weeks in an orbit known as a far retrograde orbit, which balances the moon and Earth's gravitational pulls and won't require as much fuel to keep it going. It will take pictures of the Earth and its satellites while orbiting the moon, get another photo that resembles the famous Earthrise picture taken on the Apollo 8 mission, and gather radiation data so that scientists can learn more about the potential health risks for astronauts on prolonged missions outside the Earth's insulating atmosphere. The Space Launch System rocket reached the last frontier with nearly 9 million pounds of thrust and successfully launched an uncrewed Orion spacecraft toward the moon. Although the mission was largely successful, NASA is a attentively examining the damages on the mobile launcher to prepare for future Artemis program flights, including the next one that will have people on board, Artemis 2, which is scheduled to orbit the moon no earlier than in 2024. The damage that we did see pertains to, really, just a couple of areas said NASA's Mike Serafin, Artemis mission manager, in a talk with reporters on Monday, November 21st. It just goes to show, he added, 
that the environment is not the friendliest when you have the world's most powerful rocket lifting off. A water suppression system was used during the launch of Artemis 1 to lessen the damage to the launching deck, just like the space shuttle before it. This system performed as expected. Nevertheless, Seraphin claimed that the sheer force of the liftoff caused the paint to peel off the launch tower deck of Artemis 1. Less successful were the elevators for maintaining the launch tower. Pictures show crooked framing around at least one of the the two lifts after the doors were torn off by the shockwave produced by the SLS. The elevator system is not functioning right now, Seraphin explained. The pressure basically blew the doors off our elevators. Right now, the elevators are not working, and we need to get those back into service. Big launches always cause damage to launch towers. The question is never whether, but how much. Aside from explosion and heat damage, rockets as massive as the SLS can sustain significant damage from high sound pressure levels. This is, of course, the purpose for the large amounts of water that flood the launch pad's base. It's to soften the sound, but it doesn't extend to the upper floors. The boom is so powerful that without any dampening, it may shake the pad apart and harm the rocket itself. It's a serious issue. NASA's original mission was to find better ways to fly rockets. However, as time passed, politicians gained more and more power. The location of the factories was critical. Money became the most essential goal. But aside from that, NASA is preparing to take over space even before SpaceX and Elon Musk can say, Jack. Minor damage was caused to the pneumatic lines used to service the massive SLS tanks, which deceived oxygen sensors on the pad into detecting low oxygen levels due to leaking gas, according to NASA officials. Managers also found two small flight items near the pad that shouldn't have been there. One was a piece of RTV insulating caulking from the bottom of the Orion capsule. The other was throat plug material that came out of the rocket during liftoff. Now, the most important question is, will the rocket survive in space without these two? Nevertheless, mission managers had decided before launch that the RTV problem would not be risky. Seraphin called SLS a very clean system because the damage was so small and it won't cause severe impact to the rocket. He also said that the rocket exceeded its performance goals and that the team will make some changes for Artemis 2. This is about keeping our astronauts as safe as we can, given the hostile environment we're flying into, he said. This is very important to us. Our astronauts' flight safety is the most important thing. NASA told the press not to take pictures of the launch site after a moon mission takes off. This is another big move that keeps our minds on the sky. What is it that they really don't want us to see? NASA stopped the press from filming the launch site of its space launch system after it sent the Artemis 1 moon mission into space. The press was taking videos and recording what was going on. Several space reporters said on Twitter that the agency told them they could couldn't take pictures of the Artemis 1 launch tower after the rocket took off. The senior space editor at Ars Technica, Eric Berger, tweeted that NASA did not give a reason. The reporter also said that his sources said the ban was a way to save face after the launch hurt the tower. But we thought this was just a suggestion. Now sources say that yes, the launch complex 39B tower was damaged during the Artemis 1 launch. Berger wrote on Twitter. Basically, leaks and damage happened where they weren't supposed to happen. Later, Washington Post space reporter Christian Davenport posted a statement from NASA that seemed to back up Berger's sources, but he stressed that there was no word on damage to the launch pad. Because of how things are set up now, there are restrictions on the license because of the international traffic in arms regulations, and photos are not allowed at this time. Davenport was told in a letter. As expected, there is also launch debris around the pad, which the team is looking at as we speak. No matter what NASA's reasons may be, it's pretty clear that the agency doesn't want unapproved photos of its expensive and late space launch system rocket to get out to the public. NASA loves positive publicity, and not the other way around. Do you think it was a good idea for NASA's launch operators to prohibit the press from taking photos during the SLS liftoff? Maybe Blue Origin could do the same and hide its BE-4 failure that shamefully sinks millions of dollars.